Hello and welcome to theCUBE. We are at Dreamforce 2024, actually in the New York Stock Exchange office in San Francisco. My name is Christophe Bertrand. I'm a principal analyst at theCUBE and we are going to be talking to clients, partners and Salesforce folks uh, in the next couple of days. Today, I am joined by Andrew Russo, who is uh, joining us to talk about his experience with Salesforce. Uh, Andrew, tell us about what you do, who you work for, and uh, the interesting projects you have going on. Yeah, so I work at Baca Systems, and we're a robotics manufacturing company. So we do robotics and automation for the stone countertop industry. Um, and my role really is I run almost all of our entire technology stack. So 365 for our emails and our business applications there. And then I run all of our Salesforce and really even our on-prem infrastructure. So kind of have a lot under it, but we've moved so much onto the platform that really my main focus on a day-to-day -day basis is Salesforce at our company. Great, so that's a very big remit. I mean, you have on-prem, you have of course the, the SaaS environments and Salesforce is one of those. And more importantly, and I want to double click on your business because I think uh, you said something super interesting, uh, robotics, Love that, and of course, your manufacturing robots that will be used by companies to actually create uh, their products. So it's got to be a pretty important purchase for them. Yeah, so it's actually generally for our customers one of their largest investments in their business. And generally, it also becomes their first investment. So they're buying a saw as probably one of their first pieces of automation because they've had they've done hand cutting and things like that with having people actually cutting the countertops with Makita like angle grinders and that's how it's done with hand fabrication then the first big investment generally is a saw for cutting so for our customers it's a very important investment for them and really it's important that we're able to deliver a really amazing experience that is easy for them and also able to run our company as efficient as possible that makes a lot of sense. So let's uh, talk about Salesforce and the various components that you leverage. So first of all, you're, you're uh, the Salesforce uh, architect and, and I guess operator <laughs> in yeah. many ways. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background with Salesforce and then I want to double click on how you leverage the technology in a context of creating these important robots. Yeah, so really my experience with Salesforce, I was kind of thrown into it. I didn't really have any Salesforce experience going into it. So I had been Pretty much I started out with exporting leads and I was just kind of helping with the Salesforce. And then we they had gotten Salesforce for just the sales in the beginning. Just they went to the trade show in 2014 when the company was founded, needed a place to put leads. That was Salesforce is what it was because we, when they did that decision, it was like, where do we go that we can scale and grow with instead of, okay, we have a CRM now, we kind of hit a roadblock. Um, so... Then in 2017, I started to take over more and more, and I started helping with a service cloud implementation. So we rolled out service cloud because we had sales. Service cloud on it was just the next logical thing. And that's really when I started learning Salesforce, a lot through Trailhead, honestly, mm -hmm. a lot of just self-taught learning of just figuring it out as I went. That was kind of what it was. We're a small company. We're less than 100 employees. So we don't have like a big, giant uh, mm -hmm. pool of people doing Salesforce. And now really where I've grown to is I've learned a lot more about the platform. I've got, I think now 20 plus certifications from Salesforce. I have tech um, systems architect and application architect. Um, and really we have a really large Salesforce organization where we have pretty much our entire business runs on the platform. So that's that's very impressive. Uh, 20 certifications and I believe you probably spent a lot of time here in San Francisco taking those classes uh, and others. I know that it's a, it's a very big deal here. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the platform. You, you mentioned now you, you leverage a platform in a in much wider way than when you originally started, which makes a lot of sense. Let's talk a little bit about AI and, and what you've done around AI and also any other interesting integrations uh, or, and customizations you've been able to develop. Yeah, so thinking about where we've gone and how we've kind of customized the platform to fit our business. In 2020, we had obviously the whole COVID thing happened with it. It was a big change to business, but we had the supply chain really hit us hard. Supply chain challenges. So, and I remember this, it was October. I was talking to the AE, our Salesforce account executive, or AE, and she, and I was like, honestly, we're trying to figure out this whole ERP thing. I don't have anything to buy from you. That's pretty much what I had said. And she's like, well, why don't you look at Rootstock ERP? It's on the platform app exchange. Just take a look. And I was like, okay, but I'll, I'll hear him out, but I'm, I'm not buying. I want to make it very clear. I'm not in the market to buy anything. So 
that was kind of the start of it. We started to kind of entertain the idea of what do we do with our ERP? We had it Sage X3. It was off platform. It actually runs on prem. We had Salesforce. If we were to go and re implement Sage X3, maybe it could be the best ERP. Maybe. If we go to a different platform, maybe it's the best ERP. We have Salesforce. We're going to have Salesforce for our sales and service. So do we want to have the best ERP outside of Salesforce and the best CRM for sales and service? What if we were to put our ERP on the platform? So that was a big decision that we made in 2021. And we went live in January of 2022. And we pretty much took our entire ERP. So inventory, accounting, general ledger, AP, AR, purchasing, work orders for building, everything is on the core platform, which I think makes us probably one of the more complex orgs of anybody that I know. But what that also did is it unified our entire business structure because now I don't have, oh, well, where's this data warehouse that's got this information? Where's the sales data? Now we can build dashboards that have a business 360. We can have revenue, not only from our opportunities, but also our aftermarket part sales. We can look at what are our warranties and RMAs. We can look at what's our on hand. You can have a executive dashboard like I've never seen at any other company because everything is in the platform. Wow, okay, so that's really going like zero to 100 in a matter of what, a year and a half or a couple of years post-COVID, which yeah. no, no small feat. Well, let's double click on that. I really like uh, what you've done with the integration of the, uh, so you went from CRM, uh, leads CRM to now full integration with ERP. You're running the business on this. Let's talk about some metrics. Now you've got a very, uh, complex org in, in terms of Salesforce. You have to have lots and lots of uh, workflows and processes under the hood and automations that you've built. Uh, what about the metrics? How are you measuring success? How do you say, well, we're doing better, we're, de we're doing worse, or these are areas that we can probably fine tune? Yeah, so right now for us, how we measure success is really looking at one, operational efficiency, because we've been able to take some of the errors. So even before the whole generative AI explosion is what I would just call it. Well, I think it was, is that 2022 October-ish timing, I think? We already had started doing predictive AI. So Einstein Discovery, doing predictive AI forecasting. Now we had all of our usage of inventory usage and we knew what our sales were in one place. So we started to not, forecasting sales is good, but ultimately what really matters more is how do you forecast what you need to buy in advance? So we started doing that where we were taking what our usage was and what our predicted sales would be, and we started forecasting our actual purchasing. What that allowed us to do is decrease our on-hand inventory. So when you increase inventory turn, cash flow has a massive impact to it. Right. So things like that are really where we started to look at once we were live and we had good reportability and observability into what was happening in the business. It was, what do we take as areas to start to work on? Because in our past system, it's really hard to compare a system that you had to use crystal reports to get any information <laughs> out of. And if anyone's ever done crystal reports, good luck. Uh, I may have in the past. So I feel your pain. now with Salesforce reports, end users do reporting. It's not a administrative type of thing that like you have to have a, here's the reporting person end users build Salesforce reports. So now we're able to really measure it. So if you look at our automation, right now our focus is low code, no code, because what you don't really want code. If I look at our total code that is like ours to own and manage, you could probably print it out on size 12 font and probably like maybe 10 pages of A4 like paper. That's our total actual code that like is our code that's not in managed packages. There's managed packages that are like purchased, so the ERP stuff. But from our code, we don't have a lot. A lot of it is all flows. And what that allows is us to create really quick experiences for users that save a lot of time. So screen flows, I think we're at like 700 screen flows. Or well, 700 total flows. Of that, I think it's about 70% screen flows which got, is a lot. Got it. Well, so, and more importantly, I want to just uh, go back to what you said because the implementation literally changed the financial outlook, uh, probably the margins as well. We didn't go, didn't go there, but obviously when you control inventory, you can control uh, probably also how quickly you get things delivered in the process. Uh, that has to also have a very positive customer impact. The customer experience must be enhanced because you are just better at what you do. 
is there anything that's customer facing that you've also implemented that maybe you know updating them on their order things like that uh, that's actually really funny i was just in my head thinking of like what's the big customer one the one of the m biggest things that we did that like sounds so obvious and simple is order tracking when an order ships send them the tracking number it used to be a manual thing that like the the aftermarket parts team would like oh we shipped it okay let's try and get the tracking number but I built a Salesforce record triggered flow that sends them the tracking to a custom branded tracking page that runs on Experience Cloud. And it's just it, in the URL, it has like a unique GUID that is for their order. When they click the link, it opens our branded tracking and it says if you need help, it has our contact info so we don't dump them off into like a UPS or FedEx website. Because then it's like if you're a customer, you get that and it's like, oh, now I've got to try and go talk to them. No, if you have a problem, call us. We have our relationship with our carrier, so we'll work with them to handle it. But like that, such a small thing, but customer experience is what matters because for us as a U.S. manufacturer, really what our competition and what our like competitive advantage is, is our U.S. experience because U.S. market, the U.S. market has a very different expectation than a European market. For example, if you think about the expectation of what happens in August in the U.S., we don't close down in August. In August, there isn't everyone goes on vacation. So when it comes to like part sales and stuff like that, we have to support our customers. And that's the big thing like us as a company where we really strive to be able to deliver that experience. And also it's about how do we set up ourselves for AI? Because what we did in 2022 laid the foundation for generative AI for us as a company. That's great. And that's exactly what I wanted to, uh, us to talk about. Um, so how do you leverage, uh, you know, you mentioned Einstein and, and Gen AI in general, because, yeah, it's, it's been a buzzword uh, for the past few months. Okay, great. But literally, you're running a business, you're running your business on Salesforce uh, and the platform. Now Gen AI is has become a tool for you. What has been, so what have you implemented, number one? Number two, what has been the impact uh, for end users, for customers, uh, and overall to your business? Yeah, so for us, the company, I started to look at the generative AI as Salesforce was do, talking about it. And this was in 2023, at the beginning of the year, they were talking about all the stuff at Trailblazer DX they were going to announce. And I was like, okay, this is cool. And I was like, well, I could go build this i could do like okay external services i could do it in flow kind of but then i was like you know what honestly we have other bigger fish to fry i'm not going to go try and build my own integrations because if anyone's built an integration there's one thing that's a given with an integration it will break <laughs> at some point <laughs> sometime and it will be on a holiday at like 7 p.m is when it will break it's just a given right. so i didn't want to go build it myself and uh, so we started to wait and i was like okay well let's wait and see what salesforce kind of does with it so we started the sales email pilot which was really powerful um in i think it was june of 23 so it was about a year and a couple months ago and then one thing we found out of that was that we really needed even more customization to fit what our business had so coming out of the sales emails we ended up moving over to working on um doing generative AI with prompt builder. So I was like, hey, Salesforce, we need help. We're a small company. We're mm -hmm. less than 100 employees. We don't have a massive million dollar contract value with Salesforce. We are probably one of the smaller customers they have, but some we were actually able to become pretty much the first prompt builder pilot customer in later in that year. So we started to get these hyper personalized automations that we could do to send emails that were crazy personalized. And part of it was the foundation of how we started storing customer information like about right. their recreation. What do they like to do? Do they golf? Do they ski? Because when you go to send personalized emails, that's the information you need to create those hyper personalized type of emails for sales. Then when we started to go into Copilot this year um, and building out agents for employees to use, what we started to find was that it was important to look at what our users were doing and what could help them to find information because users searching through Salesforce is such a bad use of time when you right. think about it. What they really want to do is ask what it is. So what we started to do is just collect from users. Whenever they were having a question in their mind, they were going to go dive to try and build a report for or get information. We just have them write down 
what they were going to go try and search and then send it. So we kind of made a form where we started collecting some of those things so we could then start to build out actions and allow Copilot to actually enable our users to save them time and do it on the platform where we didn't, I didn't have to build any integrations. I don't have stuff that breaks. That's great. And I think that's exactly, I think, the, uh, uh, the intent uh, of, of the technology. But you're right, it takes a lot of investment on your part, a lot of, well, thinking through uh, really what the outcome needs to be. And, and it feels like you've done uh, a lot more than <laughs> others have, who may be a lot bigger than you. Well, look, Andrew, we've covered a lot of ground. So I'd like to thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, congratulations on all the work you've done. I'm sure there's plenty more to do, but uh, it was great to learn about uh, backup systems, to learn about your business, and to learn about your integration, uh, your non, not the integrations, yeah. the fact that you don't have integrations. You've done this really uh, out of the box. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And to our viewers, well, thank you uh, so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Christophe Bertrand. We are at the New York Stock Exchange office in San Francisco covering wall-to-wall -wall Dreamforce 2024.